Okay, so now we're going to consider a really simple uh, but very rich and interesting example of static equilibrium that's going to um, flesh out, um, so illustrate the general and important concepts that we talked about in the last lecture. And it's one of those problems that includes, you know, sort of all aspects of static equilibrium problems. And so if you can, you know, master this problem and understand it really well, then you're, then you're doing really well. Okay, now the problem is deceptively simple. Okay, so all it is is we've got a block on an inclined plane like this and it's tilted, basically. And we say, well, that thing is static. Oh, why? Well, um, obviously, um, how we would analyze this before, a block on an inclined plane, we would say, ah, oh, yes, there is a force of gravity in that direction. There's a, sorry, in that direction. There's a component of that force of gravity down the incline. And if this incline were frictionless, then this block would accelerate down the incline. What's preventing that? What's keeping it static? Well, there's a force of static friction that the, that the incline exerts back up on the block, and that exactly um, uh, balances the force of gravity down. And so there's no net force in the downwards direction down the incline. There's no acceleration downwards, and so on. And so we're in, we're in equilibrium. So that addresses um, the translational equilibrium, but it does not address rotational equilibrium. Why isn't it uh, doing this? I mean, surely if I, if I tip this thing far enough, it's going to start rotating over. Or if I have it like this, uh, a horizontal, and I push sideways on it, I can make it tip over. And so I can change its angular momentum. So the angular momentum of the system could be changing. It's, it's dynamic, right? So what is keeping it static from the, um, from the rotational point of view? Well, that involves net torque, net torque being zero. And that introduces a whole new level of depth to this problem and interest. Okay, it makes it a really interesting problem, as you'll see. Okay, so, <clears throat> so let's get going. Um, so what we've got is, um, is an inclined plane. Okay, so... And that plane is inclined at some angle theta with respect to the horizontal. And we've got some um, object. Let's, let's call it a fridge. We've got a refrigerator. We've got a fridge sitting on this ramp. And we will imagine that the fridge has uh, two, two feet on the left and on the right, like a pair of feet on the left and a pair of feet on the right. Okay? And so it isn't uh, touching the incline everywhere. Just to make things simple and clear as to the physics that's going on, we're going to assume there's a little foot on the, on the right that's touching the incline and a little foot on the left that's touching the incline. So the incline will exert contact forces here and here, but not in here. Okay? So that's great. So that's our object. And so what are its properties? Well, let's see. So let's suppose that it has a height h and a width w. And let's suppose that its center of gravity point, or in a, in a uniform gravitational field, center of mass point, same thing. Okay, so you can look at that in your, in your textbook. So we'll assume that that center of mass or center of gravity point is located half right in the middle, okay, but somewhere's up, um, some distance L up from the bottom. All right, so that's the center of gravity point. So when gravity acts on this, it acts on all parts, but it's effectively the same as acting right at that center of gravity point. Okay. So <clears throat> I think that's basically it. And so let's yeah introduce the forces now. So one of the forces, of course, is the force of gravity. So there's a weight, W, pulling down equal to the mass times G. And let's not confuse this capital W for weight with this little w for width. Okay, So we got that. And the angle uh, in here. Uh, the angle that gravity makes with the perpendicular to the incline is, is theta. And what else? Okay, so now there are contact forces. Okay, so the right leg is in contact with the incline. So the incline is exerting force. And what we're going to discover, uh, this is really the interesting part of this, is that when you, um, when you tilt your... What happened to my block here? When you tilt, uh, suppose it starts out horizontal, then the normal force pushing up on the right leg equals the normal force pushing up on the left leg. They're just balanced. But when you tilt it like this, then the normal force pushing up on the right leg gets larger than the normal force pushing up on the left leg. And that has to do with exerting a counterclockwise torque. 
Okay, so that's one of the interesting aspects of this problem. So I'm going to draw that the, the normal force that the incline exerts on the right leg, I'm going to draw it long, okay, and I'm going to call that capital N. And then the normal force that the incline exerts on the left leg will be less, generally less in magnitude. And so that's equal to little n. Okay. And let's see. And then there's force of static friction. So generally speaking, the force of static friction um, um, uh, um, acting on these two legs is up the incline. So we'll call the force of static friction acting on the right leg, we'll call that capital FS. And the force of static friction acting on, on the left leg, we'll call that little fs. Okay. And so we're clearly going to require some coefficient of static friction. Okay. And that's going to play an important role in this problem. And then, just to make the situation a little more interesting and a little more general, we're going to suppose that there's a, st a person standing on this ramp and is pushing, exerting a force, just applying a force of magnitude F on the side of that fridge. And we'll suppose that that force is perpendicular to the side wall. Okay, so whether the fridge is, if the fridge is inclined like this, the force looks like that. When the, when the incline is inclined, it looks like that. When the incline is not inclined, when the ramp is not inclined, then the force looks like that. So the force is always perpendicular to the side of the fridge. Okay? Very good. And, oh, what's super important is, well, how high up are you exerting this force? So how far from the, um, from the inclined plane, perpendicular distance from the inclined plane, we'll call that capital L. And that capital L is also going to play a super important role, because if you've got some object like this and you are applying a force, it's really easy to tip it over uh, by applying a force at the top. It's a lot harder to tip it over by applying a force at the bottom. Okay? So <clears throat> point of application of forces is super important when it comes to calculating torques. Okay, so that force is being applied at that point. We have a force of gravity being applied at that point. We have uh, the normal, capital N, and the force of static friction, capital FS, applied at that point, and the little n and the little fs being applied at that point. Okay, very good. And I think that's it. So now what we're going to have to do is we're going to figure out some, some uh, axes because we're going to be saying, ah, yes, this is in translational equilibrium, so the sum of the forces is equal to zero. So we're going to split it into x and y components. So we need to choose our axes. And we also need to evaluate the torque. Well, the torque about what point? Okay, so these are two important considerations. So the first thing is, what is the orientation? What is the orientation of our x, y axes? Well, obviously having x horizontal and y vertical is kind of silly because only the gravitational forces uh, is, is you know, horizontal or vertical. All the other forces would have both horizontal and vertical components. And so what we would do is tilt it this way so that because all of the forces are either you know, down the incline or perpendicular to the incline except gravity. So the obvious orientation in this example, remember it doesn't matter which orientation you choose, choose one that's convenient. This one is obviously the convenient choice. Okay? And then the second thing, and, and, and the reason why specifically, is by choosing i hat down the incline and j hat upwards, it allows us, when we calculate, um, when, we, when, we, um, when we try to calculate for the normal and the force of static friction, um, then the, you know, the, the i hat component has only forces of static friction in it, and no normals, and the j-hat has only normals and no forces of static friction. Because at the end of the day, what we're going to do, as we always do, is we're going to look at this condition. So the dynamics is going to tell us what kind of force of static friction is required. But in order for this thing not to slip, that force of static friction must be less than or equal to fs maximum. And fs maximum is mu s, this coefficient of static friction, times the normal force. Okay, so there'll be like this kind of equation for the, this pair and this same kind of equation for this pair. So it's this kind of consideration that we need to think about. So we're really trying to solve essentially for the normals and the forces of static friction. Okay, and so by choosing the orientation this way, it, it, um, the i hat equation will contain the f's only and the j hat equation will contain the n's only. Okay, and so this is to, to solve easily to solve for the normals, capital N, little n, and capital and the frictions, capital Fs and little fs. Okay? And so the second thing we need to choose is, well, what is the, what is the origin? What is the fixed point about which we are going to evaluate all of the torques? Remember, um, static equilibrium, 
uh, or equilibrium in general, requires that um, that not only the sum of the forces is equal to zero, but the sum of the torques equals zero about any one point. And then you're guaranteed that that sum of torques will be zero about any other point. So just you just need to choose some convenient point. So the answer to what is the convenient choice to, point to choose, so the origin O is chosen. It's a point where most of the unknown forces are. So origin O at point where most of the unknown forces are applied. That's a very important general sort of principle. And why is that? Well, suppose we chose this point over here. Then it's clear that the, that, that the capital N normal force and the capital FS friction force, will, static friction force, will exert no torque about that point. So these two unknown forces will not appear in the torque equation. Okay? Whereas if I chose just some random point, say up here, then all of these forces would appear in, in, in that torque equation. So we'd have an equation with lots of the unknowns in it. If we choose a point um, uh, where, where, where there are a lot of unknown forces, let's say most of the unknown forces, then that torque equation will have as few unknowns as possible in it, much easier to solve. Okay? So in this case, there are two unknown forces at this point and two unknown forces at this point. Now, obviously, we're going to choose not that point, but that point, because at the end of the day, this whole thing is going to be rotating about that point if it tips over. Okay? So what we'll do is we will cho choose this point over here. So that will be our origin point about which we evaluate all torques. And just like directions of i hat and j hat, if you choose i hat this way, you get something. If you choose i hat the other way, all of the signs change. Okay, so we're going to choose clockwise torques to be positive. So we indicate it this way. Clockwise torques are positive. Okay? Very good. So now what we need to do is apply the conditions for equilibrium. Um, and those conditions are that the net force equals zero, then we have translational equilibrium, and the net torque about any one point, this one in particular, say, is equal to zero. Then we have um, um, uh, rotational equilibrium. Okay, so let's work with the, uh, the sum of all the forces. The net force uh, is equal to zero. So let's look in the x direction. So the sum of the forces in the x direction. So the x direction is down the incline. Okay, so we obviously have the applied force F. So there will be a force F. And then there is a component of the weight. And this is important. The weight is of magnitude mg pointing straight down. There is a component that is perpendicular to the incline, which is w cos theta. And there's a component that's parallel to the incline, which is w sine theta. Okay, and so the force, the component of the weight down the incline is positive w sine theta. Okay, so we've got that. And then the only other uh, forces with um, components down the incline are the forces of static friction. And they are up the incline, so it's negative. So it's negative capital Fs plus little fs. Okay, and that's equal to zero. So we'll call that equation number one. Okay, now uh, we look at the y components. So the j hat components of the force. So some of the forces in the y direction. Well, let's see. Let's start with the normal forces. There's a capital N and a little n, and those are in the positive direction. Capital N plus little n. And then there's a component of the weight that is um, in the negative y direction. So it's negative the weight times the cosine of theta. And that's it. The forces of static friction are, are, are parallel to the ram. OK, and so that's it. So that's equal to 0. So that's equation number two. And then the third equation is the sum of the torques. And these torques are being evaluated. These torques are being evaluated about our um, fixed point that we chose carefully, that point O there. Okay, and we have the idea that um, clockwise torques are positive. Okay, now. Well, when we calculate these torques, I want to remind you of something that's super important in solving these um, sorts of um, um, torque calculations. Okay, so the idea is 
We've already talked about this before, but I'll just remind you of it. This is a generic rigid body. And suppose that we are interested in calculating, this is a pivot point, a uh, rotation axis, say, coming out of the board, and we would like to apply a torque, a twisting force, okay, to this thing. And so we do that by, so this is our point O, we apply a, a torque, uh, we're going to uh, exert a twisting force by applying a force. And let's suppose we apply the force at some point P. And so that point P, the point of application of the force, is located with the vector R. Um, relative to uh, the point we're calculating the torque about. And suppose the force is in some random direction. Uh, let's actually make it not quite perpendicular. Let's make it like, uh, like about like that. OK, great. Now it's clear, so torque is R cross F. So R cross F, it's a torque coming out of the board towards me. OK? Um, <clears throat> so good. So, but the important point here is this. The magnitude of the torque is equal to the magnitude of the vector cross product r cross f. Okay, and so that's equal to the magnitude of r, the length of that vector, times the magnitude of f, the length of that vector, times sine of the angle between them. So remember, when you're thinking about torques, or you know, two vector a vector cross product of two vectors, slide the vectors around so that their base points are at the same point. So take r and slide it up to here, and so then the angle between uh, r and f is that angle phi there. Okay, so now the key point is this. You can write RF sine phi in two different ways. You can write it as um, R times F sine phi, or you can write it as R sine phi times F. Now those have two very different interpretations. Okay, so this interpretation here says that, okay, great. I understand that I can break this force F, this force F into two perpendicular components. Okay, so this component of the force obviously exerts no torque about O. It's only the component of the force perpendicular to R that exerts a torque, and the magnitude of that torque is going to be counterclockwise. The magnitude will be the length of this vector R times the component of the force that's perpendicular to R, which is F sine phi. The other way to interpret this, and that's going to be really useful for problems like this, is to recognize that we can also imagine the force being applied at any point along the line of force. Okay, so, and in particular, we could take, so here's the line of force. Let's take a perpendicular, drop it down from O here, okay? And so what this thing is saying, this, what's R sine phi? Well, if that angle is phi, then this angle is phi. We have a right angle triangle here, and so R, hypotenuse times sine phi, is this thing. Okay, so this is R sine phi. Okay, and so what this thing is saying is that, um, you can exert the same torque about the point O by applying um, just the perpendicular component of F at this point, okay, that's F sine phi, at a, at a lever arm distance R out, or you can apply the full force at this point, so a larger force, the full force, at a shorter moment arm distance from the axis of rotation R sine phi. Okay? The key point is, um, I've got a force that's being applied to a rigid body. It's exerting a torque about this point, and that torque would be the same whether I applied the force there or 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 there. So find a point where it's super convenient and easy to calculate. Okay. So what we need to do is work out here what is the torque, uh, what are the torques that all these various forces exert about this point O. Okay. So let's start with um, uh, the easiest one. Let's say the force F. So that force F clearly exerts a clockwise torque about point O, so it's positive. Okay? What is its magnitude? Well, I don't know. I'd have to go like R cross F, and it's all complicated. But I can apply that force F at, um, at this point, or this point, or this point, or this point, or this point. If I apply it at this point, the calculation is super easy, because the moment arm distance is just capital L, and the force is perpendicular, so it's just L times F. So positive, capital L times F. Okay. Now let's look at the gravitational. Exactly the same for the gravitational force. So the gravitational force is clearly, in that direction, is clearly going to exert a clockwise torque about O, so it's going to be positive. And how much? 
Well, you could apply that force at that point, or at that point, or at that point, or at that point. Let's apply it right at that point. If we apply it right at that point, then the torque is, is easily figured out. It's this distance, which is little l, times the component of the, of, uh, of the weight, which is down the incline. So it's positive, little l, times the weight down the incline is w sine data. Okay. And then, but the, but, the, but, but the force of gravity has a component down the incline, which exerts a clockwise torque, and a component perpendicular to the incline, which exerts a counterclockwise torque. So there's a counterclockwise torque also exerted by the force of gravity. And so what's that? Well, I'll play the same game. So the counterclockwise torque being applied at this point, I can also apply it at this point, or this point, or this point, or this point. Let's apply it right there so that my moment arm distance is simply this, which is w over 2, the, the width over 2, times the um, component of the weight perpendicular to the incline. So it's minus w over 2 times w um, cos theta, capital W cos theta. So don't confuse the little w and the capital W. Okay, so that's great. And then there's one force missing. <coughs> of course, the forces of static friction, because um, uh, the, the force of static friction, this force over here, would exert the same torque about point O as if it were applied here or here or here or here. If applied right there, well, if it's applied right there, it's zero. Okay. Similarly, the force of static friction, capital FS, is right at the point O. It exerts no torque. So the only one left is the normal force, little n. Okay. And so that exerts clearly a clockwise torque. So it's going to be positive. And it's going to be the moment arm distance, which is the full width of the fridge, times n. Okay, and all of those torques have to add up to zero. The net torque has to be zero so that we have um, rotational equilibrium as well. Okay, so that'll be called equation number three. Okay, very good. So what should we do? Let's solve these equations. Okay, so, so these are easy to solve. So we're going to solve equation number three first. So if equation number three has only um, uh, one unknown in it. So that was one of the... Um, advantages of choosing the point O right there. It minimizes the number of unknowns in that equation. And be okay, so we solve this little n according to equation number three. Um, just um, take this to the other side and, and make all these guys negative. And so just divide by w. And so you get um, a one-half w cos theta. Okay, that's this one. Divide by w and make it negative. That's 1 half w cos theta. And then a minus these two terms divided by w. So there's a minus L over w times f. And then a minus L over w times w sine theta. Okay? So that's what little n is. And then big N, we can just use equation number 2. So big N um, um, is equal to W cos theta minus little n. So big N is W cos theta minus this. W cos theta minus a half W cos theta is positive a half weight times cos theta. Um, and then minus minus is plus this same thing. L over little w f plus L little l over little w big W times sine theta. Okay, so right away we see something interesting. Right away we see that, ah uh, yes, I've got my fridge like this, and there are these two feet, like this. And what I notice is that, first of all, the total force, the normal force uh, big N and the normal force little n, when we add them up, those two cancel, and the total normal force is W cos theta, which is exactly the force of gravity, uh, the force with which gravity pushes this fridge into um, the inclined plane. Okay, but the normal force n is half the half of that force plus something. So let's suppose that this distance here is one half w cos theta. So the normal force, the upward force exerted on the right leg, is one half w cos theta plus something. So it looks like this. And then the normal force, that's capital N, and then the normal force exerted on the left leg is this. Uh, 1 half w cos theta minus the same amount. So it's like this. Okay, so that's little n. 
Okay, so you can clearly see that, uh, that that big N is bigger than a little n. Okay, so there's an unbalanced normal force, and that's super important for exerting counterclockwise torques, which keep the thing from rotating clockwise, because gravity is exerting, say about that point, gravity is exerting a clockwise torque and so on. This thing has a tendency, if you tip this thing too far, that has a tendency to start um, rotating. Okay? Um, and so you can see that the difference between these two uh, normal forces, this one bigger, this one smaller, the difference gets bigger the bigger either this is or the bigger either this is. Okay? And so it, the bigger F is, okay, so if we have even just like it horizontal like this, so theta is equal to zero, that drops out. As I apply, when I apply no force, the normal forces are of the same magnitude. When I apply a horizontal force, then the normal force on the left leg decreases and the normal force on the right leg increases until if I push it hard enough so that the left leg just starts to lift up, all of the weight is on the right and zero is on the left. Okay, the full normal force, full, full weight. Or, um, similarly, if we start with it horizontal like this with no F, so ignore that, as theta increases from zero, then the difference starts to increase. Okay, so right now it's balanced, and as we tip it up, the, w the, the normal force on the right leg is getting, is getting larger than the normal force on the left leg. Normal force on the right leg goes up, normal force on the left leg goes down. That's important um, because of torques, okay, which is the new thing that we're thinking about here. Okay, very good. Um, and the next thing is we solve the last equation, which is equation number one, which allows us to solve for... Uh, big Fs, it says that big Fs plus little fs, the sum, the net static friction force acting on that fridge, is equal to uh, the applied force F plus the weight times sine theta. Okay, so, <clears throat> so this is obvious because um, this, this is just the standard problem, okay, where we've, we've, we've got, oops, We've got an incline like this, and we've got a block, and we well, we tilt it up like this, and the force of static friction that the block exerts on the incline is just um, a W sine theta. And if we apply an additional force downwards, F, then that static friction force has to increase by that amount, F, okay, in order to keep this block from sliding down. So clearly, the sum of the static friction forces has to add up to F plus W sine theta. What's interesting about this is that... Um, um, the equations don't allow us to solve for big Fs or little Fs individually. Okay? It allows us to only solve for the sum because that's all that's required to keep that block from sliding down. Okay? So, but we will see a little bit later that um, when, we, when we are right at the verge of, of, uh, of lifting up or tipping or whatever, then the little n will go to zero, that force will go to zero, so Fs can't be any bigger than zero. And then we have a unique solution for big Fs, okay? So there's lots of interesting aspects to this problem. Okay, so very good. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to, um, we're gonna consider two special cases of this problem. We've, 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 we've introduced enough interesting stuff into this problem that we can now break, split it up into two separate problems. So one of them is to consider the case um, F equals zero and the case theta, um, now let's do it the other way around. We can consider this horizontal case, I'll just draw it. We can consider just a horizontal incline, theta is equal to zero, but we are applying a force. Okay, and then what kind of force, what's the maximum force we can apply before it tips over, that kind of stuff, okay? And then the other uh, way that we can deal with this problem is we can set f equal to zero, but have this incline non-zero. Okay, so then we're just doing this sort of a thing, and we're just tilting it up until it gets to the verge of tipping and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so we're gonna now going <clears> to <throat> um, solve these two special cases of the problem and look at it, because it's really interesting. So I'm going to erase part of the board, and I'll come back. Okay, so um, now we're going to consider the special case theta is equal to zero. So it's like this, theta is equal to zero, but we're still applying a horizontal force F, and if we push hard enough, we're going to tip that thing over, okay? And so uh, if we take the general uh, solution that we had uh, right here on the board uh, a minute ago, and we plug in theta equals zero, then our solution for little n, big n, and the two, and the sum of the static friction forces reduces to this. Now that's all fine, um, but what we want to do now is, is, we're not done, we need to see whether this makes sense, okay? And help build our intuition about how things work. 
Okay, so in this situation, we have a fridge, which is just standing on a horizontal surface. And it's got its two little legs. And there are various forces acting. Okay, so there's the usual gravitational force. So that's acting. That's the weight W. And we have a force of, of an applied force F. Okay, to the right. It's being applied at distance L above, above the ground. Uh, so this is the weight. Okay, and what else? Okay, now let's put in these. So big N, so big N, the normal force exerted on, on, on the right leg, the upward force exerted on the right leg, is half the weight plus another contribution, another term that's proportional to the applied force F. So half of the weight, half of the weight is about that long. Okay, so it's that long uh, plus a little bit. It's that long plus a little bit. So that's the normal force being applied. The upwards normal force being applied on the right leg. The upwards normal force being applied on the left leg is exactly the same half the weight, okay, minus um, that same term that's proportional to the applied force. So it's a little bit shorter than half the weight. So it looks like that. Okay. <clears throat> and so what you can see is as you apply a stronger horizontal force, um, the, 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 force, the upward force on the right leg will grow larger while the upwards force on the uh, left leg grows smaller. They start out equal, you start applying a force and it starts looking like that. Okay? And that's because basically these two forces that are different, they exert a counterclockwise torque which counters the clockwise torque that, um, that F is exerting about that point or, or about any point in that, for that matter. Okay, so let's actually look at that a little bit more carefully. Oh wait, sorry, and there's also the forces of static friction. So the forces of static friction, whatever they are, they have to add up to uh, the horizontal force F, the applied force F. And that makes sense because the only horizontal forces here are the force to the right that's being applied and the force of static friction preventing this fridge from sliding to the right. Okay, so we have the sum of the static friction forces is equal to F. Let's understand um, this difference in normal forces a little bit more clearly because this is an interesting part. I mean, clearly the sum of the two is equal to uh, e uh, the weight, obviously, but there's a difference, and the difference is important. So, um, so the sum. Of, so we have we've we've solved Newton's um, equations uh, for translational and rotational. So we've so we've solved for the static equilibrium where the sum of the forces is equal to zero and the sum of the torques about any one point is equal to zero, and that was that point. However, we are guaranteed by our general discussion that if the sum of the forces is equal to zero and the sum of the torques about any one point is equal to zero, then the sum of the torques about any point will be zero. Any other point will be zero. Let's look at this point here, right below the center of gravity point. Okay? What are the torques that all of these forces exert about that point? Okay, so as far as torques are concerned, the forces that matter are the following. I mean, for sure, that force, F, being applied at distance L above the ground, is going to exert a torque, a clockwise torque, about, about that point. So the clockwise torque that F exerts is equal to, remember that you can apply F here or here or here or here. Let's apply it right there, directly above the, uh, the point we're calculating the torque about. Uh, about. And so then the clockwise torque that the force F exerts is um, the, the, the lever arm distance capital L times F. So that's just um, L times F, okay? And the other force is the weight. The weight exerts no torque about that point because um, the, the weight could be applied there or there or there or there or there. It could be applied right there. Well, if you apply it right there, the, the torque that the weight exerts is zero. The forces of static friction exert no torque because they are the, the line of force passes right through the point we're trying to calculate the torque about. So the forces of static friction exert no torque. What's left? Well, we have this, 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 this normal little n exerting a clockwise torque and the normal big n exerting a counterclockwise torque. However, I want you to notice that little n and big n, they have a component that's both equal one half the weight. So that component we can ignore because one half the weight 
applied here will exert some torque clockwise, and one half the weight applied here will exert some torque counterclockwise, and that will, those, those will cancel. So we can ignore this part of little n and big N, and all we need to do is look at this part, the difference between them. That's the thing that's exerting a counterclockwise torque. So big N, uh, all we have to show is this one, which is little, uh, sorry, big L over W times F, and then for little n, we just need to show negative. Uh, little l over w times f. Okay? And so the clockwise torque, uh, sorry, the counterclockwise torque, and then that's it. So then the counterclockwise torque, so obviously um, the, the, the difference in big N and little n exerts a counterclockwise torque about this point over here. And what is it? Well, the counterclockwise torque is going to equal um, twice the uh, counterclockwise torque exerted by one of these, because that's counterclockwise, and that's counterclockwise of the same magnitude. So it's twice the counterclockwise torque exerted by just that single force. And the counterclockwise torque exerted by that single force is equal to the, um, the, um, <clears throat> the moment arm distance, which is half of the width. So remember that the width, the fridge is W. So it's one half the width times L over WF. So W over 2 is the moment arm distance times the force, which is L over W times F. And so then W cancels out, and the 2's cancel out, and we get a clockwise, to a counterclockwise torque of L times F. Okay, so the force F applies a clockwise torque of magnitude capital L, capital F, and then the difference in those normal forces exerts a counterclockwise torque about that point, which exactly cancels the clockwise torque, and we are in... Uh, in equilibrium um, um, uh, with respect to um, to angular motion. Okay, very good. Okay. Okay. So let's then consider that interesting case of the fridge being on the verge of tipping up. Okay. And so this means that we are applying a critical force so that the normal force on the left leg drops to zero. Okay, so that's the critical value of the normal force is equal to zero. So when the normal force on the left leg drops to zero, then the critical force required, we solve this equation for F, F is equal to W over 2 divided by L times the weight. So that tells us that the critical force uh, required just to lift the left leg up, just to start doing that, is equal to the width over 2 divided by L times the weight. So, <clears throat> so let's consider um, whether this makes sense. Okay, so um, let's first ensure that when we're applying this critical force, we are still in a state of, um, of, of equilibrium with respect to rotation. So the sum of the torques is still equal to zero. Okay, so what we've got is we're applying that critical force, and it's being applied at a height L above the floor, and so clearly that's going to exert a clockwise torque about this point, and the clockwise torque is equal to, remember we can apply that force F there, or there, or there, or there, let's apply it there, so the clockwise torque is just capital L times F critical. Okay, and then, <clears throat> and then let me see, so this normal force has dropped to zero, this normal force exerts no torque about that point. The forces of static friction exert no torque about that point. And so the only force left that can exert a torque about that point is the weight. And so the weight is pulling down here. And remember that the width of the fridge is W. And so the weight is exerting a counterclockwise torque. And that counterclockwise torque is we can apply the weight here or here or here or here. Let's apply it right at that point so that the lever arm distance is the width of the fridge divided by 2 times the weight will be the counterclockwise torque. So W over 2 times the weight. And let's just check. So if we solve, if we equate that to that so that the torques are balanced, we're still in equilibrium with respect to rotational motion. This is F critical is equal to W over 2 divided by L times the weight. Okay, so that's correct. Very good. Um, let's see, what else? <clears throat> oh, 
I also want to point out here that with this um, equation here, let's interpret that equation and see if it makes sense. So let's consider the case of making, um, making capital L, the ratio of capital L over W, larger. Okay, so if capital L over W is larger, then the critical force required to just bring that left leg up is smaller. So that means a smaller F critical. Okay, and so let's see if that makes sense. So it's, um, so it's basically easier, it's easier to tip. Okay, it's easier to bring that left leg up. Okay, and so why is that? Well, so let's suppose that we consider for a given width, so we have a fridge of a given width, okay, and we're considering, let's apply the force down here, okay, so that means L is small, okay, so if L is small, then the critical force required is large, okay, but if we apply it at a higher uh, height, so if we make L bigger, if L is bigger, then the critical force is smaller. The critical force required to just bring that left leg up, the normal force equal to zero, is smaller. Okay, so that's intuitively obvious. We can also consider making this larger by keeping L the same. Okay, so we're still gonna we're gonna apply it at some uh, some uh, fixed distance L above, but we're gonna make the fridge less wide, less and less wide. So if that's a given L. Making the fridge less and less wide means that the critical force gets smaller. Okay, so if we make the fridge like this. Okay, so we're applying um, the force at the same point, but that critical force is now going to be less than this force. Okay, it'll be easier to bring that, to, to have that left leg have zero normal uh, force, like just on the verge of tipping up. Okay, so all of that makes sense, and it's really useful to think about your answers and see whether they make sense, to just gain some intuition into how the physics of the world works. Okay, so <clears throat> okay, so now one final point about all of this is that when you've got a fridge like this, um, what we've been tacitly assuming is that the coefficient of static friction is large enough so that we can push um, hard enough before it slips to actually get the weight on the left leg equal to zero. But if that floor is really slippery, then you know there's there's no way you can push hard enough to get that leg to start lifting up before this fridge just starts to slide. So on a very slippery, slippery floor, you can't even achieve this condition that n, a little n on the left leg is equal to zero. Okay, so ideally, and that's ideally what you want, you want it such that no matter where you push on that fridge, and when, you, when you're pushing, that fridge will slide before the left leg starts to lift up. Okay, just for whatever safety reasons or whatever. So slip. So what are the conditions for slip for the fridge to slip uh, before it tips up, begins to tip up? So what we're looking for is for like for really um, um, for really small mu s for a slippery floor. That's no problem. It's the problem starts to arise when that floor gets uh, a larger and larger coefficient of static friction. So we're looking for what is mu s maximum. Okay, that's what we're looking for. Okay, so first of all, let's suppose that we are right at that point of the left leg starting to lift up. So we're at that critical point. So suppose that n, we're at that critical point, n critical is equal to zero, okay? So if that's the case, then remember that the force of static friction that the ramp can exert on the left leg, the maximum force of static friction depends upon that normal force. So we know that little fs maximum is equal to mu s times the normal. And in this critical situation, where n critical is equal to zero, then the maximum static friction force, uh, little fs maximum, is zero, which means that fs is zero. Okay, so that tells us that fs is equal to zero. Okay, so now this is interesting because now we can go back to this equation, which only gave us the sum of the two static friction forces has to equal uh, the force f. Or the two sum of the two static friction forces has to equal the force f. Okay, uh, we only had the sum; we didn't solve for them individually. Now, in this critical situation, we know that little fs is zero, so then we know that big fs is equal to f. So big fs 
in this situation is equal to F. And that makes sense. You've got your fridge here like this. There's no static friction force being exerted on the left leg, so also F, capital FS, has to equal capital F to keep that fridge in, 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 in equilibrium as far as translational motion goes. Okay? <clears throat> so great. So we got that. And so FS is equal to um, F. And we're all in this critical situation, and the force we are applying is that critical force F, this one here. Okay? Very good. Um, so here's the thing. So what we need, so what the dynamics tells us for, for equilibrium is when we solve Newton's equations um, and get this, what we, what, what we, what we um, need is that Fs is equal to F critical. Okay, and that F critical is this. So it's W over 2 divided by L times the weight. So we have that. But we also know that the static friction force exerted on the right leg also has a maximum. So we also know that Fs maximum is equal to mu s times the normal force being exerted on the right leg. The normal force being exerted on the right leg, and the normal force being exerted on the right leg in this critical situation, okay, which is the full weight. Okay, so that's mu s times the weight. Okay? Now basically what we need is that this Fs maximum, we need that to be less than this Fs so that that fridge is going to slip before that leg lifts up. So that's the crucial thing. So what we want in order to have slip before tip up, what we want <coughs> is that Fs max, the maximum static friction, the maximum, you know, before static friction breaks, is less than the required Fs. Okay? And so you're basically, so static friction breaks uh, before uh, you reach this critical condition. Okay? So what does that tell you? So Fs max is this thing, so we want this thing, mu Sw, to be less than this thing. Okay, so that means that mu s is less than or equal to this divided by w. So that's the same thing as mu s is less than um, w over 2 divided by l. So this mu s is a dimensionless number, and you can see that it just uh, depends upon the ratio of, of the width of the fridge to the height uh, about, uh, above which, uh, the height at which you are applying that critical force. Now, the worst case scenario is when you're applying that critical force right up at the very top at the height of the fridge. Okay, and so really what you want is mu s to be, like the worst case scenario is when uh, capital L is equal to h. So you want mu s less than or equal to w over 2 divided by h, the height of the fridge, okay? And so you can see that this makes, it makes sense in that um, for a small, suppose that we have a small um, uh, w over h. So that means a, a fridge that looks like this. It has a small width compared to its height. So if w uh, over h is small, that means that um, that, that the maximum value of mu s is the, is, is, is the smallest possible because it's really easy uh, to, to, to start this fridge to, to make that normal force equal to zero and to bring this fridge into that critical situation of, you know, uh, um, starting to tip up, okay? And so what you really want, so this, so this would require a really slippery surface, but if you had a fridge that was more like this, okay, then your width is large compared to your height and then mu s can be larger. And then, and then even if you push at the very top, you will not get that left leg to lift up before it starts to slip, okay? So that's really an interesting thing to think about. And one final point I wanna make about this, and this is, um, this is also interesting, is you'll notice that 
in this entire calculation, everything that we have just said, we have never once mentioned the height of the center of gravity point above the ground. Okay? All of these results are, so L, little l here, uh, plays no role whatsoever in anything that we have talked about. And now that might seem counterintuitive because you know that if you've got like a you know a vending machine or whatever, and then the problem is, oh, the center of gravity is, is too high, and so it's easy to tip and all that kind of stuff. But these considerations, when that fridge or that vending machine are on a horizontal surface, the force that you need to apply in order to start that left leg, uh, just starting to lift up, is completely independent of the center of gravity. You could have a low center of gravity, you could have a high center of gravity. The answer is completely independent of that. Where the height of the center of gravity, you know, being top heavy or whatever, where that starts to matter is when you start to tilt the incline here, or when you start to do this, okay? And then, then the, then the height of the center of gravity makes a huge difference. Okay, so next we're going to talk about this situation where we are not applying a horizontal force, but we're just tipping the incline more and more and more. And at some point, that fridge is going to tip over. And, and there, um, that height of the center of gravity above the ground makes a huge difference. Okay, so let's go on to that. So I'll race the board and be right back. Okay, so now we're going to consider the other uh, general case, and that is when uh, the force, the applied force, is equal to zero. Okay, so last time we had a horizontal ramp and we applied a force. Now we're going to say the force is equal to zero, but instead we're going to tip up the ramp like this, okay, until the thing is on the verge of tipping over. Okay. So that's the situation now. So I want you to go back to those equations, uh, the general solution for little n, big N, and the sum of the friction forces, static friction forces, and plug in big F equal to zero, and the equation is reduced to this. Okay. Now let's see if those equations make sense. Let's try to wrap our minds around this and try to gain some intuition. Okay. So let's see. So our situation now looks like this. We've got um, the we've got an incline. And we've got the fridge on here, on the incline, like that. And what do we have? So we have um, a weight. So that weight is um, pointing straight down, magnitude W. And then what's going to count here, these W cos and W sine thetas, they refer to uh, W sine theta is of course the component of the weight that's directed down the incline and W cos theta is the component of the weight perpendicular to the incline, incline pushing directly into the incline. Okay, and what else? Um, and there's no applied force here, so all we have is the normals and the static friction. So again, we're going to find that the normal force on the right-hand side is larger than the normal force on the left-hand side. So we'll draw it that way. Okay, so we see that the normal force on the right-hand side is one-half W cos theta, so half of the force with which gravity is pushing um, the, the fridge into the, uh, into the incline, um, plus something, so it's a little bigger. So it's equal to one half of this weight plus something. And that's like uh, big N. And then on the other side, little n is equal to one half uh, the force pushing into the incline, W cos theta, minus that same amount. So it's that one half minus something. Okay, and so the normal force on the left leg, little n, is smaller than the normal force on the, on the right leg. And we have forces of static friction. There's the big Fs and the little Fs. And big Fs and little Fs, the sum has to equal W sine theta, because W sine theta is the force of gravity trying to push this guy, trying to accelerate this guy down the incline. Okay? Perfect. So we have that. And what else? Okay, so what I'd like to do is, is sort of point out that the height that the... Um, that the center of gravity point is above uh, above the ground here above the above the incline now begins to matter now becomes important okay so let's see how that works so <clears throat> so what i want to do is i want to sort of give um so certainly um remember that 
if the net force is equal to zero, then um, then if the net torque is zero about any one point, it's guaranteed to be zero about any other point. Okay, we we talked about that in our general discussion. And so what I want to do is I want to evaluate um, the net torque, uh, not about this point, but about this point, just like we did in the other case, the theta equals zero case. So I want to look at the fridge like this. Okay, and we want to consider um, what are the what are the torques about this point at the center at the bottom there. Okay, so um, clearly the forces of static friction will exert no torque, um, and the component of the weight that's um, directed uh, perpendicular to the incline will exert no torque about that point. The only forces that will exert torques are the weight, the component of the weight down the incline. Okay, so we've got that component of the weight down the incline which is W sine theta, that is being applied at a moment arm distance, little l, okay, uh, above, the, above the ground. Okay? And so the bigger l is, the greater the gravitational torque. Now the height of the center of gravity above the bottom of that fridge matters. Okay? So that's one important thing to say. So l now plays a role. All right, and so let's see. And then also, these normal forces, because big N is bigger than little n, there will be a net counterclockwise torque. And so we can ignore this component, the 1 half W cos theta component, because they're equal. And so the one on the right will exert a counterclockwise torque, and the one on the left will exert an equal clockwise torque. And so these components of the force we can ignore. And so we only need to look at these components. And so uh, big N, we can, we can ignore that part, and big N, we add a positive component, which is L over W times W sine theta. And uh, for little N, we can ignore that, and it's a negative. So it's below, so it's negative L, so down, L over W times the weight times sine theta. Okay, so you can clearly see that that um, about this point over here, uh, gravity exerts a clockwise torque. So this is a clockwise torque exerted by gravity, which is equal to uh, the moment arm distance L times the perpendicular force W sine theta. And this, these forces, the, 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 the right and the left normal forces, exert a net counterclockwise torque about um, the point O. So this is counterclockwise torque, and it's going to be two times the counterclockwise torque exerted by just the right leg. Okay, and that is going to be uh, the lever arm distance W over 2, or the moment arm distance W over 2, times the force, which is L over W, times the weight times sine theta. Okay, and so you can see the 2's cancel out and the W's cancel out, and we get the same result. Uh, L times weight times sine theta. Okay, So you can see, uh, again, yet again, the role that the difference in the two normal forces plays in exerting a counterclockwise torque. In this case, to, um, to balance the clockwise torque exerted by gravity, which gets worse and worse the bigger you make L. In the previous case, it was to balance the clockwise um, uh, torque about that point exerted by the force, the applied force, F. Okay, But gravity played no role. All right, very good. So we got that. And now we're going to consider the interesting case of we crank this guy up <clears throat> like this with, with, no, with no sideways force. We just crank it up until we are on the verge of not tipping up like this, but actually tipping over. Okay, So this is um, verge of tipping over. Okay, so that verge of tipping over, it's going to be the same situation, it's the same condition. Okay, so right now there's, uh, there's an equal uh, right and left normal force as we crank it up. The normal force on the right leg increases, the normal force on the left leg uh, decreases until exactly this point here, the normal force on the left leg uh, drops to zero. So it's the same critical condition. Uh, little n, its critical value is zero. 
Okay, <coughs> so we go to these equations here and we set little n equals zero. And then we solve. What are we solving for? We're solving for the critical angle at which that uh, begins to tip over. Okay, so solving for the critical angle, we just set that equal to zero. And we have, um, well, well, <laughs> just take this over to the other side, and we have sine over cos is tan theta. The w's cancel out. And so tan theta critical is equal to w over 2 divided by L. A little L. OK. Now, this is, um, so last time we solved for, we had we had theta equals zero, and we solved for the critical force, F critical, to make, to make the left leg normal force equal to zero. Now we're solving for the critical angle to make the left leg critical force equal to zero. Okay? Perfect. So we've solved for that angle. And then we ask, now this is, this is really interesting. So why? Why? Because tan theta critical, remember that tan theta is the slope, the slope of the incline, the rise over the run. Okay, so there's some, and this involves, um, um, you know, the, the width of the fridge and, and, and the height, uh, critically, the height of the center of gravity above the bottom of the fridge. Okay, and so this is, this is interesting. So I'm going to just try to draw this diagram carefully so that it looks believable. So this is a geometrical condition. What is it saying? Well, you just draw it like this. You say, okay, here's my fridge. And... This, the center of gravity point is right over here. Okay, so I've so what I've done is I've purposely drawn the center of gravity point directly above uh, the right leg. Okay, and so that's I claim that that's what that condition is saying. And let's see if that's right. Well, so the angle of the incline is this. And we are exactly at the critical angle. Uh, it's on the verge of tipping over. Okay, and um, this distance is little l, the height of the center of gravity above the bottom of the fridge. And this distance is half the width of the fridge. And also, this angle theta critical is this angle. They're both the same angle. And so you can see that. Um, um, tan theta critical, if the center of gravity is located directly above the, uh, the tipping point there, uh, the, the, the right foot, um, then tan of theta critical is opposite w over 2 divided by L, w over 2 divided by L. Okay? So that's the geometrical condition. And so that makes total sense. So the center of gravity uh, is directly above the right foot. Okay, and that makes total sense. So if you tip it more than that theta critical, obviously the center of gravity then will be to the right of that point, and so then gravity will exert a torque about that point, and the thing will accelerate. There will be an angular acceleration, and it will actually tip over. Okay? And what else? Oh, yeah. So I should say this. So for a given W, so let's look at this condition of the slope. So for a given width w, if we make um, um, smaller l, so we have the fridge of a given width, and so that w over 2 is fixed, and we make l smaller. If we make l smaller, then it means that tan theta critical is larger, which means theta critical is larger. Okay, and that makes sense because um, if we take, um, uh, for a given width, if we take L to be small, so that means that L is, let me just draw the diagram sort of like this. Um, let, let's start with a large L. Okay, so if the L is large, it's a little bit tricky to draw this. Okay, so this is the case of large L, and for large L, tan theta for a given width, tan theta critical is small. Okay, so when the center of gravity is high, it's top heavy, then you don't have to tilt this thing uh, very much, and it, and it will begin to tip over. 
okay? Uh, whereas if the center of gravity is located low down here, then the situation is very different. Now the situation looks like this. And let's put the, um, let's make the width about the same. Try to make the width the same. Okay, so now your picture looks like this. Now your center of gravity is much lower. And, oops. Okay, so now your center of gravity is much lower. And so when you put your center of gravity directly above, <laughs> when you put your center of gravity directly above the point O, Okay, then, uh, then of course the fridge tips a lot more. So basically you can tip the fridge a lot further over uh, before reaching the condition of the center of gravity being above this, um, this, this tipping over point. Okay, so a lower center of gravity means a, mu a more stable uh, fridge. Okay, so that is important now when you start tilting the fridge. Okay, that becomes an important fact. And of course also if you have a larger W so for a given um, uh, center of gravity, if you make W larger, so suppose your center of gravity is low like that, if you make W, well, maybe it should be high like this. To improve the situation here, we can make the fridge even wider. Okay, so wider like that. So center of gravity is way up here, but you make the fridge wider, okay? like that. Okay, so we've still got a really high center of gravity. However, we've made the fridge really wide like this. And so we still can tilt it at a pretty steep angle before the center of gravity moves over uh, that tipping point. Oh, okay, very good. So those are interesting things to think about. And then finally, so tacitly, we've been assuming throughout this that, um, that the fridge, as we crank this up, that the fridge is going to, um, is going to tip over before it slips. Okay, well, in this case, it doesn't. Right, it starts to slide uh, before it tips over. Or if it's like this, it will tip over before it slides. Okay, so we've been assuming, so obviously, if the friction is very large, um, then that fridge is going to, um, you know, tip over before it begins to slide. But it's a, if it's a very slippery ramp, then you just tip it up a little bit like this, and it'll start to slide down, okay, before it tips over. So again, it's the same sort of question. Um, the question we're asking is, um, what are the conditions on um, mu s for to have slip before tip over? Okay, so that's that's an interesting question. So um, <clears throat> so what we're looking for here is a is again what is the maximum um, um, value of mu s? So. Because remember, if mu s is really small, then it's, it's easily going to slip before it tips over. So what is the maximum uh, value of mu s where, where you're going to run into danger? Okay, so it's the maximum value of mu s. So we ask the same sort of question. So as before, we look at uh, the force static friction on the left leg. When the normal force on the left leg drops to zero, then little fs maximum is zero, which means that fs is zero. So, um, so as before, uh, little fs is equal to zero, okay? And so then we look at equation number one. If we know little fs is zero, before we only knew the sum of the two, now we know one of them is zero, so now we know the other one. We know that the force of static friction uh, has to equal w sine theta. Okay, so the dynamics tells us that for this situation to be static, the force of static friction that the, um, that the left leg exerts here, and you can see this here, force of static friction that the left leg exerts is exactly equal to the component of gravity down the incline. So those two are the only horizontal forces, and they balance out. Okay, so that's what Fs needs to be for the situation to be um, uh, um, in equilibrium. Okay, um, yeah, and that's also actually theta critical, right? Theta critical. Okay, um, but we also um, um, have that, so 
this is what we need. Okay, but big FS maximum. What's that? Well, the maximum static friction force before static friction breaks is equal to mu s times the normal force, in this case, big, big N, and in this case, big N critical. And big N critical, um, when we're at the critical angle, then big N is, is supporting all of that force of gravity into the incline, which is supporting all of W cos theta. Okay, so, <coughs> so F, um, yeah. So this is equal to mu s times the normal force is, so all of that w cos theta is being supported by the right leg. Okay, so that's the case. So then finally, what we want is this. So what we want is for this to slip before it tips over. And so the condition there is we want fs maximum to be less than, um, Fs. Fs, that's, that's required. Okay? So that we, uh, so that as we're tilting this thing up, we're going to hit Fs max before we hit the required Fs at that critical angle. So it's going to slip before it tips over. Okay, so then we just look at this and we say, well, we, what we want is Fs max. That's this thing. We want that thing to be less than Fs. And Fs was this thing. Okay, so we want uh, mu s times w cos theta to be less than w sine theta. And this is theta critical. Okay? And so the weight cancels out. The result is independent of the weight. And so we have mu s is less than sine over cos. So we have mu s is less than tan theta critical. Okay? Now you should recognize this formula. So uh, remember the definition of, of tan theta critical. So if we just have um, if we just have a block on an inclined plane and we start cranking it up like this, then there will be some critical angle at which the block uh, at which you break um, static friction. And so right, it's that angle right there. And so the coefficient of static friction in this case is precisely um, um, tan theta critical, tan of this angle right here, which is the slope. Of this of this incline, so what we require is that um, that in order for the fridge to uh, to slide before it tips over like this, we require the coefficient of static friction uh, to be less than tan theta critical. Okay, and tan theta critical. Well, I should put this in. So tan theta critical. Tan theta critical is W two divided by L. Okay, so we require that. All right. So what that says, and you can see this, um, you can see that uh, if we make um, uh, L larger, so we move the center of gravity point higher, then L is bigger in the denominator, and so this number is smaller, and so then mu s needs to be even smaller in order for it to slip uh, before it tips over. So again, uh, it's a problem to have top-heavy things. Okay, so they're going to tip tip over, you know, before they start to slip. Okay, unless you have a really slippery surface. All right. So that's the basic idea here. So this is a um, um, so this is a great um, <coughs> example of static equilibrium. So basically, if you can work through this example and understand all these different cases and and torques and counter torques and all that stuff, it's uh, um, I think it'll give you a lot of good intuition about how to solve uh, these sorts of static equilibrium problems. And it's a kind of an interesting problem. I really like this problem.